Hey everyone, guess where I am? <laughs> yep, I'm in Penny Lane in Liverpool. You can see just over there is the barbershop. And basically the video that you're gonna be watching today is a video that I uploaded on my Patreon just over a month ago when I hit 50,000 subscribers. Uh, I thought I'd upload it on YouTube just to give you a little taste of what you can get on Patreon. It's a Q and A. If you hadn't realized I'm traveling around Europe, uh, obviously in Liverpool at the moment, I'll be back next month. So here's a little taste of a Patreon video. Hope you all enjoy it. Hey everyone, welcome to my very first Q&A video. This was in celebration of me hitting 50,000 subscribers. So without any further ado, let's get into these questions. Ooh, it's glary. Question number one. Age old question and probably pretty basic, but I go back and forth in my head. Lennon or McCartney? I will answer this question, but I, do, I never really like choosing a favorite Beatle because I really do feel like that within the context of the band, they do form four parts of a whole. But I think you also probably realize at this point anyway, that I am a McCartney guy. I love John Lennon. I'm working on a huge John Lennon video as we speak, but yeah, there's just something about the spirit of McCartney that I, I just love so much. There's so much about John that I love and especially within the Beatles, I, I would love to explore and talk to you about, but it's McCartney, it, 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 come on. I mean, I mean, look at him. However, if you were to ask me to choose between Paul and George, that's a much tougher question to answer. Those two guys are, it's almost impossible for me to choose between them. Question number two, what is your favorite deep cut Beatles song? Really hard one to answer, but one of my favorite deep cuts, and it is a deep cut in a fairly unpopular album, but George Harrison's It's All Too Much off Yellow Submarine is just brilliant. The Beatles never got that jammy on a lot of their tunes, but here they lay down this just amazing groove freak out where everyone is performing at a 10. I don't like to use the term overrated, but I will say that this particular track is underrated for sure. Question number three, what are some of your favorite bands from the 2000s? I was really into Muse in high school. <laughs> I just loved how over the top and bombastic that music was, but also how beautiful some of their softer tunes were. Incredible melodies, chord progressions, just stellar piano work. And yeah, I just love how much they leaned into that space rock opera sound. They got compared to a lot by Queen. I, I, I do think they kind of continued on what Queen were doing in the 70s and 80s. Matt Bellamy's incredible voice. The harmonies in a lot of the songs. Like every Muse album post their debut, but pre-resistance is an easy eight and a half out of 10 for me. I also really love MGMT, Arctic Monkeys, Radiohead, Tame Impala. Oh, I guess Tame Impala are more 2010s. Look, I'm just your basic indie rock loving white guy you probably met at a university in 2011. Question number four. Do you wish the Beatles had ever gotten back together or are you happy slash at peace with their breakup point and solo careers? Short answer. Of course I wish the Beatles got back together. Absolutely. It's like probably the thing that if I had a machine that could show me what something that never happened looked like, it would be what would a Beatles reunion look like? A proper bit, not what they did in the anthology. Like what if they got together, probably by all accounts, it was looking like it was gonna be some point in the eighties. What if they all got back together and made one more album or it would probably be a small tour. I don't think any of them had touring in mind. I, I really do wish they'd gotten back together, particularly just to hear what John Lennon would have done as well. You have some idea because of how the rest of them kind of grew and aged and what they were interested in artistically. But yeah, uh, absolutely. However, the band did need to break up. It's very clear from Get Back that they were all going in different directions and that continuing to do the Beatles at the rate that they were doing it wasn't conducive to a good creative expression. Like they'd stopped touring, they'd already experimented with so many different musical ideas. You could see by Get Back and Abbey Road that they they were kind of feeling stifled. And I definitely think they needed to go away and work on their own stuff individually. There's that point in the third part of Get Back where George talks about going away and making an album of his own and then coming back to the Beatles every now and then where he'd feel refreshed. It could be two different things. That's the world I wish could have happened. Almost like Radiohead today where, you know, you'll have Tom York going off and doing a solo album, maybe some work with Johnny Greenwood, but then they will come back together and make a Radiohead album. I think that's how the Beatles could have sustained their career. But back then that was kind of unheard of. They set the prerequisites for kind of everything. So when they broke up, 
they broke up. That was really it. Then you get into all these other like what ifs, if they did come back and do the Beatles regularly, if that was their band when they went away and did solo work, would Paul McCartney have come up with Wings and would he have been able to create as much stuff as he did in Wings? Would we have gotten the amount of incredible songs that John Lennon made? I don't know. It's, it's, it's very complicated to answer. But essentially, no, I wish they never broke up. I just wish they peeled back what people expected of them as musicians and as a band. But I do wish that they came back every few years to make more stuff together, as well as having solo careers. Having a cake and eating it too sort of thing. Question number five. What's your favorite horror movie? I really like Get Out by Jordan Peele. Like the way it just subverts the horror genre whilst also paying homage to it, but at the same time, holding a mirror up to America about how it's handled race relations in the post-Obama era. You can watch that film over and over and over again and just pick up new things every time. It's such a thoughtful, considered, funny, entertaining film with an incredible soundtrack, amazing cast. My runner up would be Suspiria from 2018. Wow, that movie is so fucking terrifying, but also really creative and artistic. Like aesthetically, it's both beautiful and grotesque. It's just so good. Can recommend. Question number six. Six? Will you be reviewing, for lack of better classification, Beatles Cinematic Universe movies, A Hard Day's Night, Yellow Submarine, etc.? Yes, I absolutely do plan on making a video on this, so look, stay tuned. It's not coming just yet, but yeah, for sure. Question number seven. Have you ever personally experimented with psychedelics, and if so, wasn't Yellow Submarine awesome? Uh, I want to answer this honestly, but I also don't want to get flagged by YouTube, so hopefully that should answer your question. <laughs> yeah, maybe I'll do another Patreon exclusive video on this another time. Question number eight. The Beatles are often cited as both the best and most influential artists of all time. Which musician musicians do you think it belongs in second place? Oh, there are so many artists worthy of this accolade, but I think it's hard to top what David Bowie brought to the world of music, culture, the idea of what like a pop star is, identity, sexuality. Like the Beatles, you know, they were a band and then individually they all did things, but individually, just as one person, I think David Bowie has done more than maybe any singular musical artist will ever accomplish. Question number, I can't remember. Question number nine, if you could only choose one of the following albums to listen to on repeat for the rest of your life, what would you choose? Two Virgins by John and Yoko or Electronic Sound by George Harrison? Wow, that's that would be so cruel to do to someone. Look, both albums are really tough listens, but I gotta go with electronic sound. There's something kind of cool about hearing the sounds of George Harrison and a primitive synthesizer from 1969. Because I enjoy a lot of ambient music and although electronic sound is not that clearly, it's still one of the earliest electronic albums by a rock artist. And there's so much significance in that fact alone. So yeah, I'll go with electronic sound. Question number 10. What is your take on the Beatles breakup? Who or what do you think is responsible for breaking the band? Breaking up the band, I guess that is. Um, John Lennon. I mean, it's proven we had so many accounts. Paul said it. I referenced it in a video. You, who broke it up? John. John did. Yeah. There was a meeting where John came in and said, hey guys, I'm leaving the group. John Lennon broke up the band. We all know they were heading in that direction. I know Paul was the one that made that press release about the McCartney album and said that the Beatles weren't looking to make any music uh, going forward. So a lot of people deem him the one who broke up the band, but we all know that McCartney didn't want the Beatles to end. He said in McCartney 321 that- I was heartbroken. I thought I'd be in this band forever. And it's McCartney. I really believe that. He loved the Beatles more than any of them. George, I feel, was sort of in the same boat as John. Like, he seemed like he didn't really mind one way or another whether the Beatles continued. He just wanted to make his own music. And, well, it certainly wasn't Ringo, so you gotta go with John. Question number 11. What are some of your favorite film soundtracks? I was wondering if you meant soundtracks, like songs included in a film, or like the score of a film. So I'm gonna answer both. I really like The Social Network, uh, both the score and the songs that are featured. Like opening with Ball and Biscuit from the White Stripes and closing with Baby You're a Rich Man by the Beatles. I mean, what a way to musically bookend your film. And between those two tracks are one of the most ahead of its time scores by Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross. Like the amount of times I've had that soundtrack on when I've needed to get shit done. Dude, I've written so many university essays to that soundtrack, I can't tell you. In terms of other scores, I really like Michael Giacchino's work, particularly the stuff he did for Pixar. He also soundtracks like my favorite TV show, Lost. 
just an amazing composer. I also love Joe Hisaishi's work in the Hayao Miyazaki Studio Ghibli films. And then as far as individual songs go, I remember when I was a teenager, I really liked the Garden State soundtrack. I know a lot of people see that film as very cringy today, but I really loved it when I was younger. And I really do think that Tarantino movies have the best soundtracks. Like I always discover great tracks and amazing artists whenever I dig into a Tarantino soundtrack. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood had some incredible late 60s songs that I'd never heard. Then there's other ones like Almost Famous, 500 Days of Summer, Call Me By Your Name has an excellent soundtrack. And for a long time, it was The Boat That Rocked, probably for pretty obvious reasons. Question number 12, and it's kind of the same question from two different people, so I'll put them both up here. Kind of multi-parted, how did you get started listening to The Beatles? Who introduced you? How old were you? Which album? Were you instantly obsessed or was it a slow burn? Uh, someone else saying, I think my love for The Beatles is closely linked with happy memories around the time I was introduced to their music. How did you fall in love with The Beatles? So this would largely be attributed to my dad. He was quite a bit older than most dads from the time. Like he was born in 1945, just a couple years younger than George Harrison. And he was born and raised in England. So he really grew up in the perfect time and place to be a Beatles fan. I think some of my earliest memories that are Beatles related are him and I in the car and when a Beatles song would come on, he would always turn it up and he'd tell me who it was. And I just remember loving what I was hearing. I can't quite remember a specific song that I heard first. Like the whole sound is so ubiquitous with my life. Like my love for them goes so far back that there's not just like one track that I was like, who is this? My dad had all their albums on vinyl, but I never really got to listen to those because by the time I started listening to them, it was the 90s, so it was CD and he only had one Beatles CD, which was Anthology One. So the first Beatles that I was regularly listening to was a lot of their early stuff, a lot of their demos, which I think is pretty cool. Like my real introduction to the Beatles was the beginnings of the band itself. And then I just kind of expanded from there. Like the first Beatles album that I bought and owned for myself was The Beatles One from 2000, which is still like the second best selling album since the beginning of the 21st century. Then I got the Love album from 2006 and that was a real game changer for me. Really got me into more of their psychedelic sounds that whole period. And from there, I was really obsessed with them. Bought every album they ever made, got the mono box set on CD, got it later on vinyl. And 15 years later, here I am talking about them on YouTube. Question 13, who are some of your favorite vocalists? You know, I had to think about this for a moment because I ended up having quite a few different answers. I'll start off with some more modern artists. Alex Turner from the Arctic Monkeys has always been a favorite. There's just something about the way that kind of like the Beatles that his Northern English Sheffield accent and it's like a nice deep baritone combined with his very poetic and imaginative lyrics makes for some incredibly smooth and intriguing vocals. I also love the artist known as Wiseblood. Among many other reasons to love her, her vocals are just mind blowing. She's like a gift from the 70s brought to us in modern day. I'll probably end up doing a video on one of her albums at some point. Oh, also Simon and Garfunkel, just ah, like, how do you top them? Heavenly. And of course I can't look past my boys. Question number 14. Do you think your acting background influences your opinion on any of the biopics you've reviewed apart from noticing all the wigs? Ah, uh, yes. So those of you who don't know, I'm also an actor, but this is definitely the the thing I do more. <laughs> and yeah, absolutely. There's this kind of recycled style of acting in biopics that I picked up on over the years. I also think it's interesting when people go for what seems like a real kind of exaggerated impersonation of a person and someone who really creates their own interpretation of that person. I love seeing how, like, how much is a performance something you'd see out of SNL? and how much of it is the character really living inside the actor. That's always fascinating to me. Definitely part of why I like biopics. Biopics. Have I been saying biopics? That word will curse me forever. Cause yeah, some of my all time favorite performances, a lot of them are actors playing people who existed in real life. Question 15, if you had to pick one, what would be your number one favorite movie? Doesn't have to be biopic or music related. I mentioned it at the top, but I'm gonna have to go with the social network. Every element of that film is just mind blowing to me. Like directed by David Fincher, who who's directed some of the best films of the last 20 years, written by Aaron Sorkin, arguably one of the most iconic screenwriters of the same amount of time, and ahead of its time soundtrack that never gets old to me. Some incredible performances. I love Andrew Garfield in that film. And I remember when it came out, 
it was like, oh, you got to see the Facebook movie. Because in 2010, Facebook was kind of like the social media platform, but it was just like a fun platform where you could post on someone's wall and give someone a poke and that kind of thing. It was very innocent. It was pre-Instagram, it was pre-Snapchat. I started using Facebook at university, which is when I saw this film as well. There's a kind of a warning in this film. There's, you look, you look at the character of Martin Zuckerberg and you're like, what is this man's intentions? Are they malicious? Does he actually want to change the world for the good? And just as the company Facebook or Meta has developed over the last few years, that film, The Social Network, has only become more prescient. I, I love it. Could watch it over and over and over again. I know there's like a hundred videos on YouTube about The Social Network, but hey, maybe I'll make one one day. I also love uh, two other films. Love Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Just a great film that I love from my childhood. It just makes me really happy. Also has a great soundtrack, as does Shaun of the Dead. Another film that I really love. Kind of subverts that horror, romantic comedy, zombie genre. Question number 16. Are you looking forward to the Breath of the Wild sequel? Your Zelda video is criminally underrated, by the way. Oh, thank you so much. It's just kind of a joke at this point how few views that video has got. But I'm very proud of that video. It just has nothing to do with the rest of my channel. And yeah, fuck yes. I'm so, so looking forward to this game. In fact, this morning they said it was going to be delayed until 2023, which was like... <sighs> heartbreaking, but sort of expected. But yeah, I'm um, I'm gonna lose a lot of productivity hours when that game comes out. Question 17. Hey Elliot, my question is this. You seem very inspired by Paul and it's clear he has an impact on you. What other Beatle or artist would you say helped shape your tastes and possible perspective regarding aspects including art, life, love, etc.? A little deep, but it's clear that there is a true impact that art has had on you and your passion within your video, within your videos proves it. Thanks. Yeah, wow, a hell of a deep question. Paul McCartney definitely has, the Beatles in general definitely have influenced my life, but I just love Paul's kind of optimism. I just think there's something great about the way he lives his life and just no matter what happens to him, he just kind of gets up and keeps going. Although I really do take as much inspiration from George Harrison. I just haven't got around to making those videos, but one day soon you'll get your George Harrison video. Paul is like the ideal embodiment of carrying on the Beatles legacy, but George is probably the most interesting person who's ever lived in my opinion. Like I have such a deep affinity and love for George, not only his time in the Beatles, but then afterwards as well and his relationship with fame, his relationship with celebrity, his relationship with Eastern practices and spiritualism and meditation. And yeah, he's just, um, he's just an incredible guy. But also Brian Wilson and his work in the Beach Boys really left a huge impact on me as well, which you probably got a bit of from my Love and Mercy video. Question number 18. What do you think of Pete Townsend's famous quote about the Beatles backing tracks being lousy? And how do you think the Beatles rank against other 60s bands if you take away the lyrical genius? All right, let's get this quote up. So he made this quote in 1966. Uh, so it only applies to the Beatles up until Rubber Soul. He said, quote, actually this afternoon, John and Whistle and I were listening to a stereo LP of the Beatles in which the voices come out of one side and the backing track comes out of the other. When you actually hear the backing tracks of the Beatles without their voices, they're flipping lousy. I'm guessing, yeah, the first point relates to the Beatles stereo mixes, which are of course not great for the time and also had no input from the Beatles. So I do give him that. The stereo mixes are quite unbalanced with, you know, drums and vocals over here and guitar and bass over here or, you know, vice versa. The panning is just, it's when stereo was first becoming a thing and the, those stereo mixes of Beatles albums, uh, especially the early ones are quite poor, I suppose, which is, Again, why I always find it strange that the mono is not the default on streaming services. And uh, anyway, I, I made a whole other video on that on my Patreon. So um, you know how I feel about it. But to say that they had lousy backing tracks is just absurd. Putting the engineering aside, yeah, there's the occasional clunky guitar solo or inconsistent playing at times, but I absolutely disagree. Like today, I was just listening to I Feel Fine and man, Ringo's incredible jazz drumming, that infectious riff that plays at the start from George and then throughout the song, or even going back further to something like All My Loving. John Lennon's insane rhythm guitar work with those uh, constant triplets that... <laughs> Paul's delightful walking bass line and that delightful guitar solo. Nah, man, Pete Townsend was just being a bitter old Betty. Question 19. If you could do a biopic about the Beatles after they broke up, what time, period, event, or album would you want the film to focus on? 
Hmm, that is such a good question. And I actually have many different answers. <laughs> that you could do a good film on just 1970 alone that tracks each Beatles release of their first post Beatles albums. Like they're all great stories in themselves. But I think the best option would probably be a movie or more likely a high budget mini series, kind of like The Crown, depicting events from 1970 or 71 to 76, where you start with George being seen as the most successful Beatle post breakup and how that affects John and Paul, who happen to be at their most divisive with Paul's hit at John on Too Many People from Ram, and then John making Imagine and sledging Paul back on How Do You Sleep. You could depict what went into making the concept for Bangladesh and it's significant on the world and the idea of a charity concert. This then moves into Paul McCartney being recognized as the least critically successful Beatle with his failed early Wings albums, plus the added knock of the three other Beatles battling him in court with Alan Klein. We see the chaotic but gripping period where Paul makes Band on the Run in Nigeria, and then it becomes the critically acclaimed album that it is, which coincides with McCartney's vindication as Alan Klein is revealed to be the untrustworthy swindler that he is. You could feature the making of Ringo's self titled album where three Beatles are actually reunited and also Ringo's first US number one hit. Then you've got the FBI surveillance of John Lennon and his own despondency with the music industry. George Harrison's 1974 could almost be a film of its own with his first unpopular album and laryngitis affected Dark Horse tour as well as his marriage breakdown. Not to mention George on a spiritual level starting to lose a bit of faith. And then you end with John abandoning music as he enters his house husband phase. Ringo struggles with commercial success in the music industry, George getting cleaned up, starting his own label, meeting Olivia and becoming friendly with the Monty Python guys, and finally Paul embarking on his successful Wings Over the World tour. I've clearly thought about this maybe just once or twice. I've also got some pretty solid ideas for a Beatles bio series, but I'm not giving that away right now. <laughs> I believe we're up to question 20. A couple of questions about Yoko Ono. Do you have a favorite Yoko Ono album or song? What is your opinion on Yoko Ono? More specifically, do you take interest in her art or music. In terms of favorite songs, I Look, I don't know actually really much of Yoko's solo output at all. Really, I haven't really delved into that, but I really like uh, Remember Love, which is like a bonus track on one of the unfinished music albums. I think it's Two Virgins. It's a bonus track on there. It's really nice. But also Let Me Count the Ways from Milk and Honey. Really gorgeous. But I do have so much respect for her as an artist, particularly the stuff that she was doing in the 60s and her contribution to the Fluxus movement. Like you got to understand that her art, her art installation, what she was as an artist is what attracted John Lennon to her in the first place. She was an intriguing person with a very peculiar mind. And I love that she stayed this kind of weird artsy person right up to today. And it seems like she has a pretty good sense of humor as well. I mean, she'd have to to keep up with John Lennon. Like one of her albums is called Yes, I'm a Witch. That's just funny. Question 21. What do you say when you meet people who tell you the Beatles are overrated? Uh, well, luckily it doesn't happen that often. And as I was just saying, I think calling anything overrated is stupid. Overrated implies that an artist, song, film, whatever, that has received a lot of praise has somehow got to that point in an unwarranted way. But the reality is, it's just someone noticing that something's popular, they don't happen to like it, and they're annoyed that the thing that people love doesn't line up with their own tastes. And if they're talking about the Beatles, look, my personal opinion, even though the Beatles are known as the most famous groundbreaking thing in the history of pop culture, I still don't think we're talking about them enough. Like they're underrated in my opinion. <laughs> I mean, why do you think I talk about them so much? But that's just my taste. When people call them underrated, obviously I'm biased, but I think that person's just being a contrarian or they just haven't heard enough of the Beatles who have made so many different types of music. I just refuse to believe that there isn't like one collection of songs or an album that someone wouldn't like, you know what I mean? Like, oh, you don't like Hard Day's Night? Sure, have you tried the White Album? Okay, you don't like the White Album. Have you tried Magical Mystery Tour? Oh, you don't like Magical Mystery Tour. Have you tried Let It Be? Like there's so many different types of, anyway, I'll... that rants for another time. <laughs> Question 22, I believe the same person asks, how do you explain to people now who are removed from their innovation, 
the Beatles innovation and the zeitgeist of the 60s. Well, again, this is partly why I made this YouTube channel. I recognize the brilliance of this band as many do, but I take joy in, I guess, spreading the good word of the Beatles to the younger folk, who by the way, make up the bulk of my audience. But also it's okay that a lot of younger people might not be aware of the Beatles. You know, there's a lot of great music from the last 70 years and I, you can't get around to it all, I suppose. Secondly, do you think there is the same level of innovation in popular music today? Relating to that question, how have demographic shifts since the 60s made it less possible for another Beatles like artists to emerge. Okay, as far as innovation goes, I think it's a lot harder to find something that's really new and truly innovative because so much of it has been explored already, but there's always new innovating artists. For example, uh, I don't listen to a lot of his music, but someone like Lil Nas X is a truly innovating figure in so many ways. For the LGBTQ plus movement, for hip hop and the R&B genre, like I've truly never seen anyone like him in the music industry before. It's also just a lot harder to break through because like the film industry, the music industry is so splintered now. You don't have just the radio and top 40 to figure out what's not only popular, but also cutting edge. It's more that the artists have to be bold and unique and take risks themselves outside of their music for them to gain that kind of status. Because if you're finding an artist where their music is cutting edge, they're probably not gonna be top 40. Like they're probably gonna be more experimental fringe artists with a smaller, more loyal following than someone like Bruno Mars, who's gaining popularity mostly for adopting an already established sound, but doing it very well. Last question. Favorite Beatles album? Oh yeah, it's... <gasps> Uh, no, are you kidding? I'm not giving this away in a Q&A video. Look, I'll let you know at some point down the line, probably at the end of some three or four hour ranking video, but that is for another time. All right, well, that brings us to the end of this Q&A video. Hope you all enjoyed yourselves. Um, hope you learned something. Yeah, I'll probably do another one of these down the line because I really enjoyed it. But otherwise, that's all from me. Thanks so much once again, and I'll catch you in the next one. Bye.